Maine, 1979. Stephen King is 31 years old. He has been married to the love of his life, Tabitha, for eight years and they have three children together. Their daughter, Naomi, is nine years old. Joseph, their son, is seven, and the toddler, Owen, is two. Despite a growing dependency on alcohol and drugs, King's life is pretty stable, for a famous author, that is. The family has just made the move to a house in Orrington. They move there in order to be closer to the University of Maine in Orono, where King is going to be the writer-in-residence, teaching creative writing. The family's new residence is located next to a busy road. And behind the rental property, there's a makeshift pet cemetery, mostly for the animals killed on said road. Stephen King is already a best-selling author with 13 books under his name, and under the pseudonym Richard Bachman, he has published an additional four novels. His novels include The Shining, The Dead Zone, and The Stand, but the most frightening and most difficult story to write was still in its infancy in 1979. It's the story that made King himself wonder if he had gone too far. You're listening to House of Words, a podcast about writers, authors, and legends. I am your host, Jason Nemour Hardin, and today we're talking about Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, how the book itself was buried and then came back to life. The first edition of Pet Cemetery was published on November 14, 1983, though this particular synopsis is from a later edition. The house looked right, felt right, to Dr. Lewis Creed. Rambling, old, unsmart, and comfortable. A place where the family could settle, the children grow, play, and explore. The rolling hills and meadows of Maine seemed a world away from the fume-smoked dangers of Chicago. Only the occasional big truck out on the two-lane highway, grinding through the gears, hammering down the long gradients, growled out an intrusive note of threat. Behind the house, on the other hand, and away from the road, that was safe. Just a carefully cleared path into the woods where generations of local children had processed with the solemn innocence of the young taking with them their dear departed pets for burial. A sad place, perhaps, but safe. Surely a safe place. Not a place to seep into your dreams, to wake you, sweating with fear and foreboding. Quote, If you want to be a writer, you must do two things above all others. Read a lot, and write a lot. There's no way around these two things that I'm aware of. No shortcut. End quote. Now before we dig into the novel, let's step a little further back into the life of a young Stephen. The man who would be known as the master of horror was born Stephen Edwin King in Portland, Maine on September 21st, 1947. His father, Donald Edwin King would soon up and leave a two-year-old Stephen, his four-year-old adopted brother David, and their mother, Nellie Ruth, leaving the small family to fend for themselves. His father, it was realized in the late 1990s, had built a second family with a new wife and four children. He never lived too far from Portland, Maine, but was dead by the time this information came to light. Times were difficult for the small family but they made it work with help from other family members. After reading Lovecraft at a rather young age, King's love for writing was established and would not let go of him ever again. He dreamed about being an accomplished writer and to his credit, made sensible choices. He graduated from Lisbon Falls High School in 1966 and later with an English degree from the University of Maine in 1970 where he would later work himself during most of the writing of Pet Cemetery. 
After completing his education, finding employment as a teacher proved difficult, and in turn, King eventually took a job at a laundromat. He did, however, continue to write in his spare time. In 1971, he married fellow author Tabitha Spruce and finally landed a job as an English teacher at Hampton Academy. The couple would soon have two children and more bills than money to pay them. King would earn a few additional hundred dollars here and there by selling a short story or two to magazines. These cash injections always seemed to come just in time, saving them from even bigger troubles. Typically, he would find an hour or two in the evenings to write after the kids had gone to bed, and although happy, he wanted more for himself and his family. For two years, he continued to live the nine to five life, getting by, though barely at times, up until he found success with his novel, Carrie, in 1973. Fast forward to 1979, as stated earlier, Stephen King was the writer in residence at the University of Maine in Orono, where he taught creative writing. The aforementioned house the family was renting at the time was adjacent to a major road where dogs and cats would frequently meet their end by passing vehicles. The situation was such that the local children had made an informal pet cemetery for their lost pets. Just so happens, the pet cemetery was located behind the residence that the kings were renting. Supposedly, the misspelling of the title of the novel came from the spelling on the sign the children had put up by the entrance to the burial ground. The sign obviously struck a nerve with King. The King's daughter, Naomi, had a cat named Smucky. Poor old Smucky, as so many others, was struck and killed by a truck on the notorious highway soon after the family moved in. King found the cat by the side of the road and, as his protagonist Lewis Creed would also do in the novel, was put in the position where he had to confront the conversation about death with his daughter. Much of the dialogue in the book relating to this is based on the exact conversation King and his daughter shared about the difficult subject. Afterwards, they bury the cat with the cross that read, Smucky, he was obedient which also appears in the book. Sometime after the incident, King would imagine what would happen if a family experienced the tragedy which befell their cat. But instead of death being the ending, what if the cat came back different and wrong? This gave the creative wheels in his mind a push, and those wheels slowly began to turn. Another vital element he decided to incorporate would hit even closer to home than the death of the cat. His son Owen, who was two years old at the time, wandered off into the garden while King and his wife were inattentive for a moment. All of a sudden, little Owen began running towards the road, something that could have ended horribly had his father not been able to grab and pull him back in time before one of the large trucks rolled by. The two elements coalesced, and King began to wonder, what if a kid had been killed instead of a pet? Hmm. I'm going a bit deeper into the story, he also decided that the book would be a retelling of The Monkey's Paw by W. W. Jacobs. In that story, a son is resurrected after a wish from his parents. This, in the end, backfires on them just like it would in King's novel. With more and more components coming together, he soon came to the realization that he had a novel in the making. With these fundamentals, life, death, resurrection, and the consequences thereof, he began playing with the concepts, trying to come up with characters, a narrative, and the evolution of the plot. The biggest question was concerning the choices of father, as he himself was, would make if he had the opportunity to bring back a child from the dead. Just think about it for a moment. Even if there was the most minuscule chance that the child would return, quote unquote, wrong, most parents would most likely take the risk, which might just be one of several reasons why the novel is considered to be one of King's scariest, if not the scariest. 
consumed and deeply embedded in the book, King began experiencing recurring dreams about corpses walking up and down the road outside. He began to think about funerals and the modern customs surrounding death and burials, all of which were explored and used to great effect in the story. Quote, People think I must be a very strange person. This is not correct. I have the heart of a small boy. It's in a glass jar on my desk. <laughs> End quote. When Stephen King sat down to start writing Pet Cemetery, he did as he's done with all his books. He allowed it to develop the way the novel wanted to unfold. Instead of following notes and plot points and detailed directions, King allowed the story to take him where it felt it needed to go, and not the other way around. But by letting his subconscious be the driving force, he might have tapped into darker emotions than he had originally planned on. Despite the sinister and dark subject matter, he remembers having a great time writing the book. It wasn't until he was done writing that he realized truly how dark of a piece it had turned out to be. Everything up to the supernatural elements had been inspired by true events. The massive trucks on the road, the pet cemetery behind the house, Owen wandering close to the road, Smucky getting killed and buried. All true. Naomi, the night after they had buried her cat, shouted, God can't have my cat. That is my cat. Let him have his own cat. All of which went into the book and made it more real. So when things begin to take a left turn, you've already invested in the reality of the characters and the story, making for a potent and engaging novel and making it easier for the reader to suspend disbelief. Pet Cemetery would be Stephen King's 14th novel, his 17th book overall if you take into account the three Richard Bachman books. He finished the book and deemed it ready enough for release by December 1982, but placed it in a drawer where it would remain for years. The novel was not an easy one for King to let go of, as he worried that it was too dark. The worry about its dark tone was such that he was very hesitant to let anyone read it when he finished it, which is the reason he shelved it and began working on his next novel, Christine, instead. This might explain the much lighter tone of Christine. He needed the complete opposite after Pet Cemetery. Christine was fun. A car coming to life and killing people is a lot more fun than a child returning from the dead. Another valid point to note is that most of those who die in Christine could be considered bad people. Quite the opposite is true when it comes to Pet Cemetery. At some point, he finally decided to show the book to his wife Tabitha, who used to be his test reader for decades. She said that it was very well written and quite good, but that she did not like it. It was too dark and ended without hope. Despite not liking it, Yet deeming it terribly intense, she told him it was too good not to publish. Still on the fence about his creation, he had friend and co-author Peter Straub read it. Straub was more blunt than his wife had been and told him that he did not like it, and additionally found it the opposite of enjoyable. That sealed it for King, for a while at least. Stephen King has never seemed dissatisfied with his writing rather more concerned with the hopelessness and bleakness of the story, which does deviate from his other stories. All of his books up to Pet Cemetery and most of the ones after had a redemptive quality or somewhat hopeful ending. Pet Cemetery did not. It was brutal and didn't at all stray from its looming melancholic and nihilistic end. He felt and still feels that the story tells the reader that everything is meaningless and that sometimes there is no hope in the end, which is something he doesn't really believe. For a good while, he had no plans of ever publishing the novel, and it most likely would not have been published if not for a bad deal he had signed early on in his career. As the story goes, in 1983, he owed Doubleday, the company with whom he signed the regrettable deal, a book. He wanted out of the deal he'd made before he became a greatly successful author, but
but not wanting to write a piece exclusively for them, he gave them Pet Cemetery, just to get the deal over and done with. Later, he would say that if it was up to him and he didn't have that outstanding bad deal with Doubleday, he would have never published the novel. Hmm. An unfortunate situation for him proved to be fortunate for so many of his readers. Quote, And the most terrifying question of all may be just how much horror the human mind can stand and still maintain a wakeful, starring, unrelenting sanity. End quote. Stephen King's habits were as similar then as they are now, though he has slowed with age. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, he would rise early, as early as a night before of drinking and drug use would allow him, and he would religiously write 2,000 words every single day. This included weekends and holidays. Only in the most absolutely dire of circumstances would he diverge from his routine. In the evenings, when the drinking and drug use would commence, he would mainly rewrite and edit. With most novels, he would spend at most three months writing them and then leave them in a drawer for about six weeks after the first draft was completed. This allowed him to later come back to it with fresh eyes. Pet Cemetery was an exception, however, as it would lie in his drawer for much longer. According to him, the novel wasn't written in the Orrington house as there was no space to write there, though if you've ever seen a photo of the house, this seems unlikely. Either way, he had befriended his neighbor across the street, much like protagonist Lewis Creed does with Judd Crandall in the novel. Crandall allowed him to use the empty room in his store, which is where he wrote the majority of the book. As dark and as bleak as the themes the book dealt with were, they make sense considering King's personal life around this time. He had developed a drinking problem in the early 1970s, one he would not manage to shake until the late 1980s. Around the time of writing Pet Cemetery, despite working on the book and having a teaching job at the university, as well as a wife and a family, King was in the middle of a vortex of drugs and booze. Though he would remember having written this book, Unlike other books that came before it, the self-destructive behavior was taking its toll. It could be that Pet Cemetery hit him too close to home when it came to his family and himself personally at the time. Several themes in the novel could be taken as being about the responsibility one has as a father, in particular when children begin to face what death is. And with regards to the lack of hope at the end, it is possible that King's subconscious steered the novel in the direction he himself felt he was headed, towards a place of no return, towards a place without hope. After all is said and done, the novel would become a great success, garnering much attention and praise despite its bleak themes, and it remains to be one of the favorites within Stephen King's bibliography. When the rights for a movie were bought, he took it upon himself to write the screenplay. He had one important demand, that the movie had to be shot in Maine, and not in a stand-in location. The demand was met, and the movie was released in 1989. After Pet Cemetery, as most of you listeners may know, Stephen King continued on to write many more great works of fiction, including one of the most famous horror novels ever, It. After a few setbacks, fortunately he managed to kick his alcohol and drug dependency in the late 1980s with help from his friends and family. As usual, let me leave you with a quote from the man himself. You can approach the act of writing with nervousness, excitement, hopefulness, or even despair. The sense that you can never completely put on the page what's in your mind and heart. You can come to the act with your fists clenched and your eyes narrowed, ready to kick ass and take down names. You can come to it because you want a girl to marry you or because you want to change the world. Come to it anyway, but lightly. Let me say it again. 
you must not come lightly to the blank page. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and will spread the word to other literature-loving friends about this podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemore Hardin. I, along with my fellow creators of this show, ask that you please consider supporting us on Patreon so we can more easily provide content to you wonderful listeners. Your tuning in is very much appreciated. Until next time, keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Crystal M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason Nemore Harden. And music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Crystal M. Sanchez and Jason Nemore Harden. <laughs>